So basically, and again, this is going to largely depend on where you stand with your, um, you know, what kind of debts you have and in what standing they are, what your credit standing is, um, what your budget looks like, you know, whether you're at a surplus, you have some left over after you've covered your basics, or whether you're coming up short, and uh, what kind of assets you have, if any. So, you know, we can look at definitely a variety of, of approaches for handling the debts. Um, up First one that's actually pretty straightforward is just increasing your payment. And, you know, that's where you just pay more than the minimum on the debt. Uh, that typically goes to principal on the debt. It helps you bypass some interest and pay off the debt a little more quickly. It will save you more money overall, typically, uh, with paying off debt because you're paying less in interest over the life of the debt. Um, you can look at things like balance transfers. So, again, this is usually going to be if your credit is in pretty good shape, that would just be where you open a new credit card um, and maybe something with a 0% uh, interest um, intro period, you know, for 12 months or so, and then pay off your existing debts with that and then, you know, pay on that card instead, kind of consolidate and pay it at zero interest. If you can get, you know, that paid off in that intro period, it can be a way to save a lot of money on the debts. Um, we could also be looking at things uh, like hardship programs that you work on directly with your creditors. So some creditors, especially credit card companies, sometimes auto, auto lenders, um, you know, they'll be able to offer short-term options where they may lower your interest rate or lower your minimum payments is usually based on, again, just you facing a financial hardship if it's difficult to make your regular minimum payment. That can be one way of being able to approach it as well, just until you get on your feet. Um, kind of similar to the balance transfer option that I mentioned just a moment ago would be something like a consolidation loan. So you may take a personal loan, you know, from your bank or credit union, pay off the debt that you have, and pay on that loan instead. And so that can help you mostly do two things, um, basically, you know, save some money on interest because that's part of the whole idea of it, um, and then also consolidate your, your payments into one payment, make it a little easier to manage. Um, so, again, it's going to be based on where you stand with your credit. You typically have to have pretty decent credit in order for that to be a really workable option and for it to actually save you money overall. Um, and then similar to that as well, you know, you look at your assets, if you have home equity that you have access to. Um, either, you know, you own your home outright and you want to put a mortgage against it to pay off some debt, maybe, again, at a lower interest rate, or if you have just some equity and you wanted to refinance your existing mortgage or attach a, um, a second lien, a second mortgage to the property, that can be a way of consolidating, you know, spreading your payments out over a long period of time and usually paying at a lower interest rate as well. Um, beyond that, we could be looking at things like um, debt settlement options, where you essentially make offers to your creditors to pay um, a lump sum, you know, usually around 50 to 80 percent of what is owed on the debt. They may agree to call it even at that point, and so, you know, you settle the debt that way, or um, something like what Green Path offers, uh, which is a debt management program. That would be an arrangement to pay the debt in full. You'd have a consolidated payment, and uh, depending, again, on the type of creditor, um, you may be able to get a lower interest rate that helps you save money and pay it off more quickly. And ultimately, you know, as a last resort, if, if things are just, you know, nothing else is going to work, if, if you can't really afford to pay anything on the debts or, or, you know, a much lower amount than with these other options, you could look at a bankruptcy option, either a Chapter 7 or Chapter 13, and we can kind of go into details on that or differences there if anybody has questions on that. Um, but that's kind of a last resort option that a lot of people um, will go to if nothing else is really going to work. So um, regardless of, you know, what you're kind of leaning toward, it can be a really good idea to talk to a financial uh, counselor like myself, um, a financial and credit counselor, to help you just kind of identify which options are most realistic for you and which are going to be most in accord with your goals, your financial goals. And, um, you know, that can usually be done for free or at low cost just for you to get that information from a certified counselor. And so they can really help you um, get pointed in the right direction with that kind of thing. All right. 
Thank you, Taylor. And again, if you have any questions, go ahead, use the chat feature and send them our way. Um, I had emailed quite a few folks um, last Friday who had signed up and have their questions in front of me. So I'm just going to go ahead, um, but if you have additional questions, go ahead and use the chat feature. Um, I think, you know what, Taylor, I think while we were having technical issues, I don't think anyone heard you on where to start. That was the very first one that stuck out for me. So uh, someone uh, sent us a, an email saying, where do I start? I don't, I don't really even know how to start. Sure. Um, yeah, and that's a really good question, and that's exactly where we should start. So um, basically there are going to be a few pieces of information you're going to want to have access to before you can really narrow down how you want to attack debt. Um, so we can kind of break it down into four, I think. Um, so first of all, for, for, first of all, you want to know um, where you stand with the debts. So you know, what kind of debts you owe, who they're owed to, what the standing is, are they current, are they past due, um, general terms of the debts, you know, what your interest rates are, what your payments are, the balance amount, that kind of thing. Um, if you you know, have kind of been pushing it to the back burner and maybe, you know, if you've missed some payments on debts and haven't really paid attention to it in a while, it may be a good idea for you to pull your own credit report um, just so that you know what's out there basically. Because among other things, sometimes debts can be sent to different creditors, especially if they fall past due. Um, so you might go to a website like annualcreditreport.com. That's a good website for looking at your credit report, and it was actually set up by the credit bureaus, Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion, to allow consumers access to the free reports they're entitled to every year. You can get a free report from each of those three credit bureaus at that website uh, every single year. So that can be a good place to start, just so you know where you stand. Uh, the other thing that you're going to want to know is what your credit standing is. Um, basically, you know, what your credit score is, you just know that in general whether you feel like you have generally good credit or whether you've been struggling with credit, that can really narrow down which options are going to be realistic for you because some options are just going to be based on you having good credit. And if that's not the case, well, don't worry about looking into those. We'll look at some other options. Uh, you'll also want to know what your budget looks like. Um, so you want to know in general, you know, what your income is, how much you're bringing in each month, uh, particularly take home, um, you know, what you have after taxes and deductions are taken out of your paychecks. You also want to know what your expenses look like. Um, so what's going out of the, uh, of the bank account every month. And, you know, particularly you want to be able to prioritize your most important expenses. That's really going to be, first of all, your housing, making sure you have a roof over your head. Uh, also your utilities, making sure the lights are on, the water's running. Uh, any transportation costs, you want to make sure, you know, among other things, you're able to get to and from work. Um, and, you know, things like food and insurance and, and these really high impact areas of your budget. So you want to have a really good outline of what that looks like overall. And that'll tell you whether you have some left over at the end of the month or whether you're coming up short. If so, how much? And again, that'll just further help narrow down what options can be available. And then finally, you want to know what your assets are if any, um, if you have anything in your bank account or if you have home equity that you have access to uh, or if you have maybe a vehicle that's paid off that you don't need to commute, if you have an extra car for the family, something like that, or access to a 401k that you could take a loan out against, for example. You know, there are pros and cons to different ways of accessing assets. And, uh, again, the assets that you have can help to narrow down what options are available. So I would say those four main areas are what you want to have basically in hand before you can really go and consider your, your options. You want to know uh, where you stand with your debts, what your credit standing is, your budget, and your assets. So that's where I would start every single time. All right. That sounds great. I just had another question come in. Um, it's about medical debt. It's, so it says, I have medical debt, um, but it's not showing on my credit report. Should I worry about it? So. Yeah, it's definitely something that you want to keep an eye on and that you want to address. You don't want to ignore it um, by any means. Um, most often when you have, when you get a medical bill, um, they're going to give you, you know, a number of days to really address it with them. The provider will. 
Um, so, you know, that might be 30 to 90 days or so that you have to follow up with them to make some kind of payment arrangement to pay it in full or, you know, a lot of them have, you know, just in-house arrangements that they can make with you. Um, they can quite often be fairly lenient. Um, they like you to send them something uh, rather than nothing, and that might just be a minimal kind of a nominal amount, but, um, you know, you definitely want to talk to them about it and not just let it go is the main point that I would say. Um, if you have a medical bill that's come up and you haven't addressed it within 90 days, um, quite often at that point what they'll do is send it to a collection agency. And at that point, they'll usually start reporting it on your credit report as a delinquent medical account. And um, that can do a lot of damage to your, um, to your credit report, to your credit score, because it shows up as a bill, a payment that you missed, essentially. It's a, it's a bill that you haven't paid that you're delinquent on. And, uh, timely payment history is the number one factor going into your credit score. It accounts for 35% of your credit score. So, um, yeah, you definitely want to be in touch with your provider um, when you get those bills. Um, make sure you're making a payment arrangement with them or applying for some kind of hardship forgiveness program. Sometimes they have, uh, you know, programs that can help you out with those bills um, that you have to apply for. So just make sure you're on the same page with them and that you have a plan in place. All right. Well, you know what? I went ahead and put this slide up here because I have a couple of questions about credit that have come in. Um, so maybe the best thing to do is just kind of go briefly over the uh, what goes into a credit score because the questions had to do with um, I, you know, uh, my friend. Here's one. My friend just filed bankruptcy and her credit went up. How does that work? Um, I had another one about um, my credit is shot. I need a car. You know, so maybe first let's go. Let's go and talk a little bit about the credit and credit score, and then take it from there. Okay. All right. So yeah, um, we're looking at a few different areas that go into your FICO credit score. Um, the one I just mentioned, biggest one is is definitely uh, timely payment history. So just making sure that your um, payments are made on time. That's 35% of the credit score. So anything that's you know, reported on your credit report, um, you need to make sure that uh, you're paying by the due date. Um, and then even a lot of accounts that are not reported on the credit uh, report, like you know, your electric bill or your cellular phone bill or you know, these kinds of utilities especially, those are things where if you miss too many payments on those, um, they may start reporting it on your credit report as, um, as a delinquent debt. So, um, that all goes into your timely uh, payment history, and so that's what, you know, the number one thing. Uh, number two, uh, in terms of impact on your credit score, is the, uh, it says amounts owed, I think, on the screen there. Um, that might be a little bit misleading. So the, the number two is called credit utilization, um, and that's 30% of your credit score. So that means that you want to look at basically how much available credit do you have? You know, if you have a credit card, it's going to have a credit limit. You know, maybe you have a credit card with a $2,000 credit limit, for example, and that credit limit gets reported on your uh, credit report. And so having the most amount of that um, limit still free and available to be used is what's going to help with your utilization. So if you have a $2,000 credit card and that is maxed out, you owe $2,000 on it, you really don't have any available credit showing. You can't really use it anymore. Um, and so that can actually do a lot of damage to your uh, credit score as well. It doesn't look good on your credit report from a lender's perspective. Um, so you want to make sure that your balances on credit cards are typically, I mean, the lower the better uh, as a rule. Um, some people use the rule of thumb of saying, you know, you want to make sure that you uh, never use more than 30% of your credit line. So, you know, again, say if you have a $2,000 uh, credit limit on a credit card, you, know, you can use as a rule of thumb saying, well, you never want to have more than $600 on the balance for it. Um, again, but the lower the better. And if possible, what you want to do is to not even carry a balance over month to month. You want to just pay it in full. And that's really what allows you to optimize your, your credit as far as that goes. So, keeping as much available credit as possible will really help uh, as far as the score. Um, number three going into the credit score is length of credit history. That's 15%. So this is just something, like it sounds, it's something that comes with time. The longer you have a, 
a good positive account showing up on your credit report, um, the better it is for your credit score. And so when I say a good, a positive account, I would say things, you know, you don't want to have things like collection accounts or any negatives on it like that. But things like a credit card, the longer you have open uh, in general, the better it's going to be for your score or the longer you've had, you know, an auto loan or a mortgage, um, you know, all that gets factored into basically an average length of credit history for you. And so that's just something as you get older, um, you have more and more opportunity to build up that length of credit history. So a lot of people starting out, you know, that may be the weakest area of their credit, but it's just something that comes with time. And if you make your timely payments, keep accounts open, then uh, that'll help build that up. Uh, the next one going into the, um, into the credit score is going to be uh, new credit. Um, so that's going to be 10% of your credit score. And this largely means, you know, opening up new credit lines. Um, basically, anytime you apply for credit, what happens uh, on the creditor side is that they do what's called a hard credit inquiry, and that can temporarily lower your credit score um, just anytime you apply for credit. So as a general rule, you want to get that, leave those spaced out. If you apply for a bunch of different um, kinds of credit or, or a bunch of different, or apply with a bunch of different creditors all at once, um, you know, you're looking to open up a bunch of credit cards all at once, kind of looks like you might be panicking um, kind of as far as your credit reports. So um, you want to keep those spaced out. Um, and, you know, the, the worse your credit is, I would say, the longer you want to space those inquiries out. So if your credit isn't great, you want to space those inquiries out by at least a year, ideally. Um, you might be able to get away with doing it a little bit more often than that if your credit is in better shape. Um, and then last, uh, last factor going into the credit score is going to be 10% as well, and that's uh, types of credit used or variety of credit. And this just means that, you know, you, what looks best on the credit report is actually to have a number of different kinds of accounts. So if all you have is a credit card or, or a few credit cards, that's not going to look as good as if you have a credit card and an auto loan or a credit card, an auto loan, and a mortgage or, uh, you know, a credit card, an auto loan, a mortgage, and a personal loan. Again, just the more variety of credit. Again, positive types of credit, not um, things like collection accounts, but just normal uh, types of credit that, that you know, ordinary people have. Um, the more variety you have and the better that looks. It shows that you can handle different types of uh, debt, different types of credit accounts. So, um, yeah, that's kind of what goes into it. Okay, so I have actually just a couple questions more on credit, and um, so I wanted to bunch those together, if that's okay, since we're on this topic. Um, the first one, let's let's go with this. Um, let's go with this one. So uh, I've been told that open accounts with a zero balance can hurt your credit. Can you elaborate on this? So I would say in general, actually, probably the opposite is the case. Um, if you have an open credit card with zero balance on it, that credit limit gets reported onto your credit report, and that gets factored into your overall credit utilization. So for example, if you were to close that open line of credit with a zero balance, you would have less total available credit, and if you had balances on other accounts, that increases your credit utilization, which could actually bring down the score. So in general, from a credit perspective, it's best to keep accounts open, actually, um, because it, it adds to that total available credit, which helps your utilization. It also um, just can, it can add, depending on the age of the account, to your total length of credit, to your average length of credit, it shows that credit history there uh, with the ongoing open account. And so I would actually say in general, you know, if you have a credit card account that you don't use anymore, you know, you can get rid of the card. You can, you know, cut up the card or shred it or something like that. But, you know, go ahead and leave it open on your credit report because that's actually helping you. Yeah, the only time that you would probably want them to close it if it's too much of a temptation to use, right? <laughs> okay, from all right. From a credit perspective, it's good to leave it open. Yeah. From a behavioral perspective, <laughs> if you don't trust yourself, then you might want to. There you go. Um, the other question that uh, seemed to go pretty well with this one is, um, how can I build credit? I have a repossession and was late on my credit card a few times. So it's about building credit. Absolutely. So um, 
and and again, you know, it's kind of we, we want to start with the present. So just because you have some negative stuff in in the past on a credit report doesn't mean you can't really start optimizing it and actually seeing some progress. Um, so again, I would just generally when I'm counseling clients. Um, on building up credit, I'm usually hitting on those two biggest factors going into the credit score. So first off, timely payment history. Uh, second is gonna be the credit utilization or the amount owed relative to your credit limit. So the first thing that I would ask in a case like that is, okay, so you have this repossession in the credit report. Um, do you owe any kind of deficiency on it? Uh, sometimes what happens if you have a, if you have a um, repossession is that the creditor will take back the vehicle and then they will generally go and sell it at auction and they'll try to pay off as much on the loan or the remainder of the lease as possible out of the sale of the car, but quite often they don't get enough for it to be able to pay it off in full. So whatever remains on that is typically still gonna be reported on your credit report as a delinquent debt that you still owe. You still technically owe that. So you know, as far as timely payment history goes, Number one factor will be to try to clear up any delinquent accounts that you have showing. Um, so, you know, you might want to make some sort of a payment arrangement on that, um, you know, whether it's talking to the creditor directly, working something out with them where you can make payments on it, or, you know, one of these other approaches we're talking about, you know, a debt settlement offer, or, you know, sometimes we can set those up on things like debt management programs. So that's going to be number one. Yeah, do you have those, any delinquent accounts like that from the repossession? the repossession or anything else, you might have some other accounts that are past due. That's number one for building up your credit is getting rid of those. Um, number two, of course, is just gonna be on an ongoing basis, continuing to make timely payments on any of your other accounts to make sure that you don't have any more missed payments show on, showing up in the future. And that just means that the missed payments are going farther back in your credit report. They weigh less and less heavily the farther back they go and you have a higher proportion of timely payments showing up to kind of start outweighing those. Um, and then you also want to work on trying to get yourself um, in good standing as far as your credit utilization like we talked about. So if you don't have a credit card open, you don't have any available credit showing, you may want to actually open one. Um, and if you can't qualify for a regular unsecured credit card, you might go to a, you know, a bank or a credit union and talk about uh, getting a secured credit card. Um, those are designed for people to build credit again after they've had, you know, negative stuff on their report. And so the way that basically would work is you go and you could offer um, basically some collateral. You know, your bank may say, okay, give us $300. We're going to set that aside in collateral, and we're going to give you this credit card with a $300 credit limit. And that way you can just start using that as you would a normal credit card. They report it on your credit report. They show that credit line, that available credit that you have. And if you use it responsibly, again, keeping the uh, balance down as low as you can and then paying it off in full every month so you're not carrying that balance over and not paying interest, um, that can really help to build up the credit utilization side of it. So I would say start off with those. The other ones can really just kind of come with time. Obviously, length of credit history is going to come with time. Um, you want to, if you have a repossession on your report, you probably want to wait a while for applying for credit, so you don't want to have a lot of new credit showing up. Um, but if you focus on paying the past due amounts, staying current with your current debts that you have, and um, looking into an option to start building up your utilization, your available credit um, with, a, with a credit card or a secured credit card, then you'll probably see a lot of progress in your score. Okay. Um the the one other one we had this come in earlier um it is i have an old debt uh for my dentist should i just let it fall off it's five years old yeah this is something um that a question that we actually get a lot um there can be statutes of limitations that apply um, for debts, for the collectability of debts, and at a certain point they may end up actually falling off your credit report. I always caution my clients with uh, relying on that, though. I'm always very, very careful about that because, um, first of all, it can vary state to state. Um, you know, a lot of different laws can apply in this regard, and, and I'm, you know, not a legal expert, so you sometimes even have to talk to an attorney to really know what's going to happen with it. 
Um, but you may, I mean, depending on the size of the debt, there may be a couple of different approaches that you could take. I mean, it's possible it could fall off. Be aware that there are a number of things that can actually reset that timeline, though. Um, so even something like um, just sending a payment to the creditor uh, on the debt can actually reset that timeline. Um, so, you know, if it's five years old, but you sent a payment to them six months ago, you might have to just reset the timeline on that statute of limitations. Um, or even sometimes just calling them and acknowledging that you owe the debt can even reset the timeline depending on circumstances. Um, so always be cautious with that. Be aware as well that, um, especially if it's a relatively large amount, the longer it goes, um, you know, with nothing happening on it, either a payment or a settlement, um, the more of a risk you run of the creditor engaging in more aggressive collection activity against you. So if they haven't been able to collect on it in five years, it's getting closer to a potential statute of limitations, and if it's a large debt, it, they may see it as being worth their while to try to, you know, pursue legal action against you, um, possibly to try to get, um, you know, a legal judgment, a writ of garnishment, possibly to go after your wages um, or, um, you know, placing liens against your assets. So I would just say I, I urge caution in a case like that. You don't want to necessarily rely on statutes of limitations um, to apply because there are a lot of complicating factors that can go into it, and you are definitely running a risk when you do that. For sure. As far as how long things appear, quote, unquote, on your credit report, um, why don't you talk to that? The... Yeah, so if you have um, credit history can go back, I think it's up to 10 years. Um, a delinquent account um, may drop off your credit report after uh, seven to eight years or so, but that's seven to eight years generally after the last activity on the report, um, not since when the account started. Um, so, um, yeah, as far as when it, you know, it actually getting reported to the credit bureaus, again, something I urge caution on. Uh, if you figure, well, it's just going to drop off after a while. Um, well, if you're really close to the end of that, maybe, but otherwise it might be a good idea, if you're concerned with your credit, to try to make some kind of an arrangement on it. Or at least give, you know, one of our experts a call who can kind of take a look at it individually and see what the options are as far as all that goes. Um, and also just, you know, how is your credit? Is it good? Is it, is it, you know, can you get the best rate out there? Do you need credit? That kind of thing as well. Um, here's another question um, that was just uh, sent our way. So uh, the question is this, should I take out a personal loan with high interest in order to consolidate credit cards that are close to going to collections? And then the second part of that question is, would it be better uh, saving money and settling once I have the cash on hand. You know, you see a lot of advertisement for, you know, settle for less than you owe. And um, so maybe you could take a minute and talk about that. Yeah, if we kind of unpack that a little bit, because there's a lot of different, um, you know, kind of points that we can cover in that question. It's a really good question. Um, so when credit cards are getting close to going to collections, usually they're in charge-off status. And typically at that point, now that doesn't mean you don't owe them. A lot of people think, kind of think that too, that you don't owe them if they're charged off. No, you still owe the debt. But usually at that point, they stop charging interest. Um, usually they're not applying the same high rate that they previously were. And so from a perspective of your payments overall, you're in a case like that very likely to be paying a lot more overall if you take out a high interest consolidation loan to pay off those kinds of accounts. You know, again, those credit cards that are past due already and almost ready to be sent to collection. Um, so I would be cautious uh, in that regard, just from a perspective of not wanting to pay a whole lot more interest than you necessarily have to. In a case like that, it might even be a better idea to look into something along the lines of a debt management program where you can have some arrangements set up with the creditors, um, hopefully before they get sent to a collection agency, um, to just start taking those uh, balances down over time and not having to pay that interest that you would with a consolidation loan. Um, so, you know, that's something you want to be aware of. Um, 
You also want to be very aware of your cash flow. Okay, you know, how much are these payments on this consolidation loan actually going to be? Um, because again, you're in this case likely not going to be saving money on interest. Are you able to afford the actual payment um, on the loan? Is it going to fit into your budget? Um, if you wait um, and just, you know, try to save your money to settle once you have enough cash to uh, pay those accounts off, you know, you're, depending on, again, how much uh, you have in savings to get started with, um, they're likely to go to collection agencies, um, which could be another negative mark on the credit report. Um, in the meantime, you are likely to continue getting collection calls uh, from the original creditor and then the collection agency once it gets sent over to that collection agency. Uh, so just so that you're kind of prepared for that. And that's something else that you can work on getting them to stop doing too, but that would kind of be another question. Um, but, um, but yeah, just be aware again, it's the longer you wait in addressing a debt like that, um, the higher risk you run of the creditor, again, going to more aggressive collection activity, um, you know, calling you um, eventually possibly legal action, um, you know, trying to get writs of garnishment or liens against the assets and that kind of thing. So from a risk management perspective, you do run more and more of a risk the longer you, you wait. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of the way I would approach it. It, it really is kind of on an individual basis, um, but uh, that's what I would say you want to keep in mind. The other thing to be aware of with settlement as well is that, um, in general, if they forgive more than about 600 uh, on the debts uh, when you go to do the settlement, then you may actually be liable for the forgiven amount um, as far as your taxes go. It may actually be counted as taxable income. And um, so, you know, just be aware of where you stand with regard to your uh, withholding with your um, tax brackets, that kind of thing. If you usually are, you know, just breaking even on your taxes um, when you go and file, just be aware, you know, it's possible you might end up owing some. Um, again, you'll want to talk to a tax expert about that, really, to get a good view of it. But that's, you know, one risk with settlement as well. The other thing is that it's typically not going to be as positive for your credit if you settle it versus paying it in full. But, um, you know, depending on how much you have in savings, how quickly you're able to save could be a way to get taxed it a little bit more quickly as well. Um, so these are just the considerations that I would want to keep in mind if you were looking uh, to do something like that, the consolidation loan versus the settlement versus something like a debt management program. Yeah, so you definitely, as far as the consolidation loan, you'd want to look at what kind of interest rate you would be uh, charged on that loan. So you evaluate, well, okay, what are my cards charging me? And I guess the most important thing is do you have the ability to pay that loan off and do you have the willpower not to put any more charges on the charge card? Because that's the last thing you want to do is put that dot somewhere else and then rack up more dots. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of considerations with those options. Um, again, I'm just going to, you know, you're welcome to call uh, one of our counselors, our experts, and they will be able to talk to you for free um, if you have anything that's really, really specific. Um, Okay, so um, this one we got earlier in the week. Um, so this one is, I have some credit problems due to debt. Uh, I, opened a, I opened a credit card to build my credit, but Credit Karma says it is poor. What's the deal? Yeah, so again, there are just a number of factors that could be going into why you're not seeing the positive you know, progress in your, in your credit that you'd like to. Um, a lot of people are kind of come under the misconception that to build credit, I mean, first of all, it is correct that it may be good to open up a credit card in order to build credit and build positive credit history. But a lot of people think that you have to, for example, carry over a balance from month to month in order to do that, or you won't get the credit for it. And so what happens a lot of the time is, is people will figure, well, okay, I'm going to open up a credit card to build my credit, and then I'll, you know, charge some things on the credit card, and then I'll make minimum payments to show that I'm paying on time on the account. So if you, and of course, it is good to pay on time, and certainly want to pay at least the minimum so that you're not, you know, falling behind on the, uh, 
on the credit report. But um, if, again, your utilization is high, you know, again, if you have a $2,000 credit limit and say you have, you know, 1500 or 1800 in balances on it, that's not really going to be helping you a whole lot. Uh, that's a really high utilization compared to your available credit. You really want to keep that down as low as possible. And um, really, you don't just want to be paying minimum payments either, right? ideally, because if you're paying minimums on credit cards, most of the time, the vast majority of your payment is going to interest anyway. You're making very little progress on the debt, and you're really not getting anywhere. Um, so you certainly want to pay at least the minimum, and you want to make sure that your balance is down at a low level. And again, the ideal is going to be to just pay that thing off in full every single month so you don't pay any interest, you don't carry over that balance, but you still show that timely payment history. So again, there could be some other things going on in a case like that. You would probably want to maybe have a look at your credit report itself um, and make sure that, you know, you don't have some other delinquent accounts that are showing up because those are things that can kind of weigh down your credit score. Even if you're doing some other things right, like using a credit card responsibly, sometimes you're not going to see the progress that you want if you have other accounts that are past due and showing up as being delinquent or late. So um, those would be, the, I guess, again, the two things that I would really want to target and, and kind of see, well, in your circumstance, do either of these apply? Do you have any other delinquent accounts um, or uh, that, that are still outstanding that you still owe? And um, do you have a really high balance on your credit card relative to your limit? Um, so once you resolve those, then you'll probably see the progress that you'd like to see. Sounds good. Um, I have one other question only that was sent in earlier, and um, so if you have any questions, go ahead and chat them in because I don't see any others being chatted. Um, the last question that I have here is about the Dave Ramsey course at uh, at church. Uh, this uh, this person said they took it at church. Um, is it better to pay off debt with the high interest rate or the smaller balance? And I, I put together a little slide just to kind of help you out there, Taylor, as you're working through this uh, okay. description. Here you go. Sounds good. So, yeah, this is a, a really good question, too. Um, and we're basically looking at uh, two strategies here. So we've got the debt snowball strategy and the debt avalanche strategy. So um, debt snowball, that's basically the Ramsey approach. Um, that's where you... Um, you know, you have multiple accounts, you know, maybe multiple credit cards or loans or whatever the case might be, and uh, you basically arrange them in terms of the uh, balances on the account, so from smallest to largest. And the idea behind this is that you want to um, make your minimum payments at least on all the accounts, and then if you have extra to throw against one of the accounts, you want to throw it against the account that has the smallest balance and to try to knock that out of the way as quickly as possible. And then what you do at that point is however much you had been sending to that account, you know, the minimum plus whatever extra, you roll that over and that becomes your extra payment on the next smallest balance. And so it's the idea of starting with the snowball and then you, you know, roll it up, it picks up momentum, and then, you know, you're taking care of the debts one by one until you get rid of the largest one. Um, so this is really a good approach for folks who um, uh, maybe have, you know, need some help with motivation, I would say. Um, if, you know, you really want to see progress, you're highly motivated by seeing accounts paid off in full, and that sort of really keeps you going um, as far as, you know, sticking to your plan, that's a good approach because you're starting with the ones that are easiest to take care of first. You see that progress, um, and that way keeps you uh, keeps you motivated. Debt avalanche is going to be where you arrange your debts in order from the highest interest rate to the lowest interest rate. And so same basic strategy um, as far as making sure you're making at least your minimum payments on each of the debts. But then if you have that extra that you want to apply to one of them, you start by throwing that against the one that has the highest rate of interest first. That gets rid of the high interest debt uh, sooner rather than the lower interest debt. And ultimately that will save you the most. Um, in terms of overall interest payments. You pay less in finance charges over the life of the debt. And then again, yeah, as you pay off uh, those higher interest accounts, you roll over the payments and start applying them as extra to the uh, lower interest debts. Um, and, you know, you can definitely see it uh, moving fairly quickly, but it's not necessarily going to be that same, you know, 
speed at which you pay off the first account and see that progress at first. So this is people or for people who are highly motivated and really want to avoid uh, paying interest as much as possible. Uh, the debt avalanche approach is a really good uh, way to go in that case. So again, it just depends on on you. It depends on whether you think uh, you're, how well you can stick to a plan, how motivated you are, and what's most important to you. Are you looking to just try to start making some progress and you want that motivation and you want the debt snowball, or do you want to save the most on interest and get past it as quickly as possible, in which case the avalanche is going to work best? Okay, here's a follow-up uh, question on that. If you choose a credit card with a balance, do you stop accruing interest and late payments? So I'm a little... I'm a little confused on if you choose. Close. Oh, that's it. Okay, if you close, oh, here you go. <laughs> yeah. So if you close a credit card with a balance, um, you stop accruing interest and late payments. Um, well, not necessarily. Um, the creditor can still charge interest at that point. If you close a credit card, that only means um, that you don't have that credit available to you anymore. The credit line is no longer open. You can't charge anything on the card. So different creditors may have different policies on this. I mean, it might be part of a deal that you have with a creditor where they may agree to lower the interest rate or they may agree to waive the interest uh, fully uh, once you close the account. But again, that's a creditor-specific policy. Just closing the account isn't necessarily going to do that for you. Uh, so yeah, you're still typically paying interest on a card that is closed. Um, and if you miss a payment um, on the card, yeah, you're still probably, you know, you're going to have that late fee that's going to that's going to attach to it. So, uh, and and they can still report that uh, as a negative on the credit report. So certainly, you know, still pay, the same payment schedule is going to apply even if the card is closed, um, unless you make a, a change to that with the creditor. But you want to be very uh, explicit with the creditor about what's going to happen when you close this account. Are you just closing the card unilaterally, or are you doing it? in conjunction with a maybe a program or a hardship option that the creditor is offering you where they may agree to lower or waive the interest in exchange for closing it. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. Sure. All right. Does anyone have any other questions? I, uh, a couple people have chatted in. Can you send the slides? I mean, I'm, I'm happy to send the slides. We just used a couple of them. Um, from the questions that we had got prior, um, and I'm happy to send those out. If you would like um, to, to receive those, chat my chat uh, your email address to me, and I will I will be happy to send those few slides out. Are there any other questions? Okay. Um, well, I tell you what, we did go over, and I, again, I am, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you for your patience at the beginning. I'm glad that it was uh, worked out and you were able to, to hear us. Um, that being said, we'll stay here just a few more minutes. So if you have any additional questions, you can go ahead and chat them in. Otherwise, um, thank you so much for joining us. I'm really happy you're here. We will be featuring Ready, Set, File. Um, that is going to be next week. Um, I'm sorry, in two weeks, our next webinar Wednesday, which is February 7th. Um, it, we're going to be focusing on income tax by first helping you get ready to file by looking at the documents you're going to need. We'll then talk a little bit about getting set by reviewing your tax present, um, preparation options. And then we'll wrap it up with the file portion of the webinar where we'll discuss, you know, timelines and what to watch out for if you're expecting a refund. Um, so I hope you can join us. Again, that is February 7th at 12 noon Eastern. Um, other than that, I thank you again and have a great day, everyone.